Software is ubiquitous and testing is under pressure. Pressure to do more with lower budgets, fewer resources, decreased timescales, an increased expectation of the quality we're going to deliver, more complex software, and certainly more complex systems that we're having to test. What effect are these challenges having on testers and on the teams they work with, and indeed on our organisations and our customers? I'm Isabel Evans, and after decades in the industry as a software tester and in software quality, I'm now a postgraduate research student at the University of Malta, and I'm examining the effect of one of the ways that we seek to address these challenges. I'm looking at the experiences of testers with the automation and tools that they use. And the question I have for you today is, what if our quest to resolve our challenges with automation and tooling is illusory? What if we're seeking for magical solutions that we're never going to achieve because magic simply doesn't exist? So in this presentation, what I'm going to do is talk to you about the research I've been doing and my findings so far to share with you some of the things that surprised me around people's experiences of test tools and automation. Now I mentioned to you that I'm at the University of Malta and you may be wondering why Malta? Why choose the University of Malta? And the reason is it's an incredibly good ICT department. The faculty is very, very interesting and they're already doing research into the experiences of testers. They're looking at testers' cognitive patterns while they're doing testing, that type of research. So what I wanted to do fit with that existing research team. And of course, Malta is a lovely place to visit, particularly in February when the skies are blue, the weather is clement and the sea is calm. So altogether, a lovely place to be. When I started this research, I had expertise. I had experience in industry. I was a consultant going out into companies to find out what problems they had and try and help them resolve them. And I was seeing in those companies I was visiting and also in debates in social media that within the industry, within the testing community, a couple of things coming out. One of them was that Although for many people, they find the implementation of test automation and test tools to be useful and achievable, there are also many people who are finding it challenging, if not impossible. And along with that, a debate about the reasons for this. So one of the reasons that some people talk about is around the actual possible scope of automation and tooling, how much of testing can be done by tools and how much requires human input. So that's one area to consider. Another is around testers' skill sets. So a lot of people have been talking over the last few years about the need for the testing community to increase its technical ability, to be able to do more with code, for example, in order to be able to manipulate some of the automation uh, sets that are out there. And there's also a group of people who are looking at tool design usability. So people trying to provide better interfaces for testing tools. People looking at how to improve the tool set. And my preconception as I came into this research was that we had a usability problem and we could resolve it with usability methods. And I'm going to tell you now, spoiler alert, I was surprised by what I found in my results. So let's start by thinking about what we mean by automation. On the left hand side here, you can see a picture of the model of washing machine that was the very first washing machine I ever owned. It's a Hoover Pulsator. They're very simple machines, highly efficient. You can do a whole set of bedding in three minutes to get it completely washed. It's extraordinary. That's the actual bit where the machine is doing the washing. Of course, you have to fill the machine with buckets or with a hose pipe from the tap because it hasn't got any water input. 
And when you want to empty the machine, you unclip the hose on the side and put it down into a bucket and the water just pours out the bottom. There's a hole in the bottom of the machine. It's got a hand mangle for putting the, the sheets or the clothes through to push the water out. You have to rinse separately. There's a lot of stuff here that this machine does not do for you, yet it was marvellous. It was absolutely brilliant and amazing to be able to use this after having washed sheets by hand. And if any of you, if any of you have done that, you'll know it's hard work. It's hard physical work. You walk up and down in the bath on the sheets, and then you have to haul them out all wet and so on and so forth. So let's compare that on the right hand side with a modern automatic washing machine. And this one, it says it's a clever solution that works as easily as a contactless payment machine, a payment system, sorry. So that's brilliant. Automatic washing. It does your washing automatically. It takes away a lot of the effort that you would have had with the Hoover Pulsator. It's not as efficient. It takes longer to do it. There's more settings, so you can put a greater range of fabrics and clothes and so on in there. That would be true. And there's a lot of things it doesn't do for you. It doesn't pick up and sort the dirty clothes. It doesn't do the ironing. It doesn't put the clothes away afterwards. It's not an automatic laundry system. It's an automatic washing machine. It does one task out of the whole sequence of activities that make up doing the laundry. And I think when we think about our test tools and our test automation, we should be thinking in the same way. Some of our tools will be like this Hoover Pulsator. It might be very simple. It might still require a lot of work, but it's a whole lot better than what we had before. And some of our tools will be like this automatic washing machine. We'll perhaps actually take one task out of our set of activities and actually automate it. But there's still a lot of other things that we need to do to accomplish the entire task of testing. We can maybe automate and tool small parts of it. So, let's take this on another step. We know that the purpose of software and the purpose of the software industry is to automate people's tasks and activities. That's what it's there for. Right back to the very beginning, when we go back to the Second World War and the 1940s and 1950s, it was about automating tasks that were impossible for people to do by hand in a timely manner. Very complex calculations, for example. So by and large, when we look at automating other people's activities, it's about saving time and money. It's about doing things that we couldn't do before. It's about moving repetition because we know when people repeat tasks, that's when they make mistakes. It's about doing things in a safer way. So there's no doubt that automation provided by the software industry within which we work gives benefits. However, it also has an effect on people and some of that's beneficial, but there are also disadvantages. And that has included over the history of the industry and indeed predating it back into the industrial revolutions, people losing their jobs, losing their professions, losing their whole communities sometimes. Very, very distinct disadvantages for some people. So now let's think about our own work. We're working in software. Can our work be automated? And for many people, the answer to that is no. This is highly intellectual work at every stage. The design, the build, the coding, the testing, all of them are challenging cognitive activities. How could they be automated? And yet, we seek to automate them in order to save time and money, do new things, remove repetition, be safer, gain benefits. And for every stage of the IT development cycle, there is somebody looking at tooling and automation, looking at tooling and automation to replace programming, looking at tooling and automation to replace testing or to replace parts of it. It's not just the testing community that are facing these challenges, in fact. Other parts of the IT community are also facing challenges and there are benefits. We would not want to be working without compilers, believe me. 
you would not want to be working in the machine code the whole time. And there are disadvantages, as we'll see. So let's think a little about the benefits of automation. This is from a paper by Julian Harty. Many of you will know Julian and it's certainly worth looking at the work he's doing on analytics um, and how analytics can be used in testing and to improve software quality. And in this paper, which is actually about automating usability testing, which is a surprise, is it not? Because we see that as being a very human-centric activity. He says, no matter how valuable in-person testing is, effective automation is able to increase the value of overall testing by increasing its range. In other words, there are things we can do with tools that we cannot do in person. The in-person testing is still valuable, but it can be extended. And on the other hand, if you look at things that James Bark and Michael Bolton are writing about, they talk very much about how um, we need to examine what we're saying about tools and automation, that we have shallow attitudes to what is possible because we have a shallow attitude to testing itself. And you'll be aware, I'm sure, of the test versus check debate and what James and Michael have talked about in that context. The important thing for this talk is to realise there are a range of opinions about what is possible and what is beneficial. And whatever person you talk to with who, in that range of opinions, if you talk, for example, to Michael, he will tell you there are a lot of places that tools are useful, just don't call it automation. And if you talk to Julian, he'll say there are a lot of places that tools are useful and necessary, but we still need in-person testing. So although it looks like a debate, actually there's quite a lot of agreement across that uh, spectrum of views. Now, when I came into the research, as I said, I had preconceptions about what it is, what it was that I wanted to look at and what sort of solutions I was going to be looking for in the research. And one of the great things about doing this as a piece of academic research is my expertise has been challenged. It's not enough for me to say I'm an expert, I've got this number of decades, I know what I'm doing. No, every statement I make I have to provide evidence. And so my supervisors challenged me on my original research idea and pushed me back and pushed me back to the point where in my research question I can't even say what challenges are people facing because people might not be facing challenges and I can't have that preconception in my question. So my question is, what are the experiences of testers with automation and tools? And the approach I took, or I'm taking actually, because I'm right in the middle of this at the moment, um, is based on particular ways of finding out information. So I'm using what's called a mixed methods approach, which means I'm taking various different approaches to gathering data and also to analyze it and fundamentally what's called a qualitative approach. Now what this means is I take a small sample and I look at it in depth. So just as with uh, in-person usability testing you might have 10, 12, 15 people in your sample, in this qualitative research I'm not expected to have a large sample. It's more about looking in depth at the answers that those people in that sample give to open questions. Um, so I had conversations with people at conferences, I interviewed a number of industry experts, not all the experts in the industry, a very small number. Um, more of that to do. I did some surveys and workshops and note the deliberate mistake, I trust you all put your hands up when you notice that one. Um, and I used 117 people's responses in the work. Um, I had more responses than that, but some of them didn't answer the question, tell me a story about an experience you've had with test tools and automation, which means that it's not useful for this research. So there's 117 people. Now for a piece of qualitative research, that's regarded as quite a large sample because there's so much data coming out of it. And it was open questions. So long text answers, and I went through all that text, did a frequency analysis, in other words, counted how many times different words and phrases were used, and what's called thematic coding. 
So I'd done what's a, a literature review. I'd looked to see what people were talking about on blogs, in industry publications and in academic publications about tools and automation and picked out some key words like management challenges or uh, usability or technical challenges and so on and so forth. And also, and this is very important, you look at themes that emerge from the data. So things that you weren't expecting to see in there, but which came out to you as you're going through over and over again. And I must have gone through that data about 18 or 20 times over and over again, the same data, looking for patterns. So it's very much about looking for patterns, finding patterns that you didn't expect to find there. It's about looking for things you didn't know already, not your preconceptions. The first thing that was interesting was who were the participants? So people were from all over the globe answering uh, surveys, both in the workshops and online surveys. And the online surveys are particularly important with this. Um, people came from quite a wide range of roles. And a key thing here is most people, or a lot of people have mul multiple roles. So that, those numbers add up to more than 117. And that's because people were doing more than one job at once. And some of that was a result of organizations attempting to introduce automation and then reducing team sizes. So people had more to do because of the automation and sometimes conflicting things to do. People came from a wide range of specialisms, not just testing, but also project management and uh, development and coding and so on. But one of the things that was really interesting for me was how people described their background. Because you might have a preconception that most people in software testing come from a software engineering background and have that training. But there were quite a lot of people who came from quite diverse backgrounds into a testing role. Boat building, gardening, international relations, pharmacy, all sorts of different things, not necessarily from software engineering. And I think you can see that if we have people coming in from a diverse range of backgrounds, first of all, that's a really good thing because we get a broader view about what the software is like. And we know that diverse teams help us produce better software. But secondly, it means we cannot have a preconception about the technical knowledge of the people doing the testing and what we can expect from them. So some of those people had come from quite different roles and backgrounds and were now working as automation engineers. So think of the learning curve they've gone through to get there. Very, very interesting. And then also here, I just want you to notice that there's a very wide range of different industries, different domains for the software under test. Now, all of this is important because this is not just me looking at a small sample of people in one organization with one sort of software. This is global. This is multi-industry and domain, multiple backgrounds and multiple roles. This is quite significantly a wide group of people and diverse group of people. So I had two main findings. And the first one of these is that many testers feel themselves to be stuck in limbo with magical solutions. The illustration there is uh, by Gustave Doré. It's an illustration from Dante's Divine Comedy. These wise people are stuck in limbo. They're not in heaven. They're not in hell. They can't move on. They sit all day having wise and meaningful discussions and nothing ever changes. We debate and we debate and nothing ever changes. We have to change that lack of change. So let's think about, first of all, the testers lived experience of tools and automation. Lived experience is about how people's lives are affected by something. In this case, a piece of software. It's not just about the user interface, although that contributes. It's not just about the usability of the software, although that contributes to people's frustration levels, for example. It's not just about the user experience, which as we know, is about how 
someone reacts to the entire experience of dealing not just with the software, but the people providing it, the company, the organisation. The lived experience sits outside all of that and includes it and also talks about people's emotional experiences and the impact on their lives of the software and systems that they're using. And a key result is that test automation brings benefits, but it has disadvantages. And a key one of that is an effect on people's motivation. People become dissociated from their roles. When automation removes part of your job, part of your role, you start perhaps to feel like you're part of a production line and not somebody doing an important cognitive task. So, emotional responses. I wasn't expecting to find these. We're IT people. Do we do emotions? No. We are logical. We are objective. We never get upset. We never feel strongly about things. Or if we do, we hold it in. We're calm. We're collected. We know that. Other people, they're different, but not us, not us. And actually I had a big hang on there moment because I was not going through the data looking for emotions. And about 111 survey responses in, I suddenly went, there's a lot of emotion here. This is in written responses, responses coming in online, as well as stuff from workshops and conversations. People using emojis, people using strong language, people using punctuation in a very intense way. And then in the conversations and interviews, the body language, people in tears, all sorts of things like that. It was, it was quite shocking, the level of emotion. And I went right back through the data again and rechecked all the data records for evidence of emotion as, as a startling finding. And I was so surprised by the results that I then asked my supervisors to go through the data and they went through the data and found even more instances of strong emotion. Um, and there you can see a little bit of the spreadsheet and I'm looking there at uh, the green is positive emotions, the red is negative emotions and issues, and then how many questions did people answer emotionally? Because I needed to look at, was this just actually a few individuals who are very emotional and everybody else objective? or was it more generally across the sample set? 35% of the respondents on the online survey showed emotion, and I wasn't asking them for emotion. The questions were, tell me a bit about yourself, tell me a story about your experience with test automation, was it easy or difficult to use that tool or automation? Have you ever avoided using a tool? What are the characteristics of a good tool? What tools are used in your organisation and what tools do you use? And it was only that last one where there were no emotional responses. And that's because most of the responses just said, see above to question six, what tools are used in your organisation? And a number of people replied even to that question emotionally. Too many. It's a jungle. Far too many people frustrated just by the number of different tools they were having to engage with. The types of people, things people were saying was, I want to do something that matters. After being frustrated by it, as it cost me a day and a billing run, I ended up quietly prior of breaking it. That's very testily, isn't it? Being pleased that you've broken the tool that you're using. Um, people saying, I think I should leave my job and look for a company that actually values what I do. It's scary and I always get stuck. It made my blood boil. If we make this crap again, what's the point? What the hell were they thinking? That particular one was about a company where the developers, more technical, had been given three months to learn how to use the automation framework. And the testers, less technical, were budgeted three weeks by management. What the hell were they thinking? impossible tasks, stuck in limbo with magical solutions. The manager didn't realise that software's a bloody difficult thing to build. That particular project, the automation was budgeted for three months to build it and it took three years. 
I didn't really count what I did as testing. I was just checking scripts, checking results. This particular person said, I didn't even know what the software was doing really. It was like reading the description of somebody on a particularly bad factory production line. They were totally dissociated from their role. The role they were doing was not a human one. They had been reduced to being a robot. This is not good. It's not good for the individual, not good for their organisation, not good for the industry as a whole. This is not what automation should be doing for us. And one of the key things around the problems with motivation is that in, in trying to automate testing, we forget what needs to be tested. It's like the worm Erebus that eats its tail. We have some software and we need to test that. So to test it, we design some tests. And we're going to make mistakes. I tell you this now, if you haven't realised it yet, you will make mistakes when you design your tests. So you have to test and review the tests that you have designed. And then if we choose to automate those tests in some way, we have to build the automation scripts based on our test designs. And that's another piece of software which now needs testing. So how are we going to test it? We're going to need to design some tests for the automation scripts. And those are going to need testing. And maybe if we're testing the automation scripts to save time and money, as we always tell ourselves when we're addressing these magical solutions, maybe we need to automate those tests of the automation scripts. Look, we're going round in a circle. When will we stop? The magic's gone wrong. We're stuck in limbo with nothing happening. Remember, the manager didn't realise that software is a bloody difficult thing to build. And you remember, those automation scripts, it's another piece of software. And if you acquire a tool off the shelf from a vendor, it's another software acquisition. You have to do it with the same seriousness that you would acquire any other piece of software. You have to test it in the way that you would any other piece of software. Otherwise, how do you know whether you can trust it? So here we are with our testers stuck in limbo with magical solutions. And those quotes actually gave me that title for this area of the research findings. A couple of people in their survey responses actually said that they felt like they were dealing with something that other people saw as being a magical solution to all problems. That magic was going to happen just by acquiring a test tool, just by acquiring some automation. And another person talked about being stuck in limbo because they had been requested, required, to run some test automation as part of their role. And yet, because of where the test automation resided in the overall system and environment, and because of their role, they didn't have access to be able to run it. They were just stuck in limbo with a requirement on them to do something that the security systems didn't allow them to do. And you think, well, that's ludicrous. How could that happen? And then as I started talking about these findings to other testers, other people were saying, yeah, that's happened to me too. I also have had that problem where the security settings around the test automation mean that I cannot carry out my job. And there is no way in the organisation to overcome those security blocks. It's extraordinary, the things that we're doing to ourselves. OK, so the second finding is that usability is in itself sometimes an illusion. Improving usability on some of these tools actually made the situation worse. Is that not a strange thing? That is very peculiar. So let's think about what the testers' experiences were of the usability of the tool set and automation that they were being required to use. 
I'm going to start by saying that there are usability problems with tools and various bits of research that people have done and many industry reports talk about usability as being one of the many known and existing problems and challenges for successful test tooling and test automation. We all know and have done for many, many years that lack of management support is a problem. We know that installation over and over again becomes a problem. Maintenance, for decades, for decades we've been talking about how maintenance of the test sets is a major problem. Right from early capture replay tools, you talk to anybody who's been around in the industry for a few decades and they will tell you maintenance problems on the tests in test tools has been around for a long time. It comes up over and over again. It came up in the results that I had just for the last couple of years. Security we've already mentioned. And then this last one here, seamful tool sets. Now this actually, this idea came to me from uh, the literature review where I was looking at some research somebody had done about the tool sets that's done by academic, so that's used by academic researchers. It's a particular tool set which I've had to painfully le learn to use. It's quite a different tool set to one I've used, any I've used before. And these tools were described as seamful as opposed to seamless. So a seamless experience with tools. We'd expect the data to flow from one tool to another with no human intervention, everything arriving in the right place at the right time. But instead, if it's a seamful experience, you're having to copy the data out to spreadsheets and then back into another tool again, fiddle around with it, change the formats, you know the type of thing. And guess what? People in their responses on the surveys were talking about their experiences with the set of tools they had to use and how those tools did not work together and how the test tools didn't work with the development team's tools. It was a seamful experience. And one person actually said to me, I use 50% of my brain working out what the tools need, to need from me. I've only got 50% left to use on the thing, the problem that I'm actually trying to resolve. That's an enormous cognitive load to put on people and an enormous reduction in their efficiency. It's slowing them down. So some example quotes here that you can see on the slides when you look at it. So running the tests is easy. The difficult part is maintaining the test set. Um, it looks cool, but actually it was really difficult to set up. We didn't have online information. Um, there's user unfriendly UI and configuration. Not everything worked. It's a whole set of problems there. And uh, the stuck in limbo comment again. So what are my new findings around usability? And the key thing here is the illusion. And the first one of these is people who are designing tools over-focusing on the attractiveness of the UI and not on the usefulness of the software. So people were saying, well, it looked cool, but I couldn't carry my tasks out. So you can imagine people are acquiring tools because they look good. Perhaps they've seen them at a conference expo. Looks really lovely. Worked in the demo. You can't actually use it for your own task. Um, and in particular in that, um, a very sort of superficial view of what makes something easy to use. So it looks pretty, but it doesn't support you through your flow of work tasks. It doesn't support you through the activities that you want to use. And in particular, that you have to change your processes to fit with the tool, as opposed to the tool adapting to the way you want to work as a human. This is a very key thing, not just for our tool set, but for software in general. You know, this is, this is the way that we damage other people's lives by forcing our way of working onto them. The second finding was that there was a very narrow perception of who the user group is, who the testers are for these tools. So the persona development was being done in quite a trivial, trivial way. And there wasn't a view of um, different people using the same tool. 
So one of the quotes I had in was from somebody with a strong development background saying that the tool wasn't flexible enough. And I had another quote in from somebody else saying, actually, this tool was designed for developers. It isn't suitable for us who are less technical testers. And quite often in a team, you're going to have a range of abilities, a range of technical knowledge. You maybe need a, a range of interfaces or a range of ways that the tools can be used. And the third thing is about the tools not supporting change and growth for those personas and for their requirements, which will change over time. So we also already saw that maintenance is a problem and this is like a, another way of looking at it. The people themselves who are using the tools, they will learn over time what they want to do and they will learn about the tool and that will change the way they interact with it. And the tool should be able to support that, support in increasing skill levels and increasing knowledge. But also, because the software under test is changing, what people require to do with the tool will change, and that might be quite radical. So the tool needs to allow for change and growth in the requirements for that tool. In terms of the change and growth, I want to use the analogy of a pianola and a concert grand. Now with a pianola, a player piano, you have a role that you put into it that holds the music. It's a script for the music. And you can play the same piece of music over and over again just by loading the roll and starting it going. No intervention required. It's automatic. But it is... What's the word I want? It is limited. You can only play the music that's been provided on the rolls and there'll be a limited number of rolls. And furthermore, you're not going to learn how to play the piano. On the other hand, if you have a concert grand, you can play anything you want. But if I took you, perhaps somebody who doesn't play a musical instrument, and I put you in the Carnegie Hall with an orchestra and a concert grand, you wouldn't be happy. You wouldn't know how to play that concerto. You wouldn't know how to improvise during the concerto. You wouldn't be able to play jazz or classical or anything. But in between those two, there's a whole range of keyboards and pianos of different sorts, giving different amounts of help, training people, increasing their knowledge, allowing them to grow so that you move from being somebody who can only load the pianola, maybe towards somebody who can play music. And very few people, very few people, will become concert pianists. And we know who they are in the industry. I'm thinking of Angie Jones here, for example. We know she is playing in the Carnegie Hall of Software Test Automation, but we're not all that good. Not all of us have that skill set, that flair, that talent that she has, that genius for the code. So we're all at different stages. And what we need are tools that help us, educate us, train us, give us opportunities to all the time move step by step closer to an aspiration that only some people will reach. And this is important. The tools that we have need to support us in our growth. I mentioned earlier that there's an effect on motivation. And there's a number of papers that have been published over the years um, on motivation. Hackman and Oldman in the 70s talked about job mix. And what they were talking about was that a job is frustrating and demotivating if it's too stressful, and it's frustrating and demotivating if it's too boring. And you need a mix of tasks in your job that allow you to move from the more stressful, cognitively challenging aspects, where you're perhaps decision-making, designing, whatever, into tasks which are simple to do and relatively trivial, that allow your brain to rest, that you can relax into. You need that mix. You need to move from one to the other through the day and through the week. And then 
uh, in the 1990s, Warden and Nicholson did a study on people in IT jobs using Hackman and Oldman's diagnostic survey. And one of the things that came out from that research is that QA and testing is simultaneously the most stressful and the most boring of all the roles in IT. We have such a range of activities that we do and also such a range of stresses on us and pressures because of the work we're doing and because of people's reaction to our work and because we're always dealing with risk and analyzing risk and making difficult decisions and trying to explain information to other people. We all know those stresses and that's why conferences like these are so important because we have to get together as a community and help each other through those stressful times and moments that we all experience however much we've been doing the work for however long, it is still stressful. So, if you take a part of that role and you automate it, what happens? Either, as we saw in some of the evidence that I found, people are left with jobs that are debilitating because they are so boring and trivial, where you've just been turned into a robot, or people are left with roles where the level of stress is unalleviated week by week. There are no simpler tasks to go back to. The simple pleasure of just running some tests and looking at the results. And as testers, we do enjoy that. We enjoy that challenge and also that relaxation, the going through the results the checking part of testing is actually not something you want to do the whole time, but it has its, it has its pleasures. And we need to think about that when we're thinking about how we motivate our teams and ourselves, that we want that mix of different skill sets being used, different ways of using our brains, different activities together to make a rounded week that's a good role to have. Quite recently, Stuart Reed did some work on uh, motivating, uh, motivated or motivating, what type of tester are you? And again, revisited both Hackman and Oldman and Warden and Nicholson in a more recent context. So I recommend having a look at that, uh, again, in terms of thinking about job mixes and, and what people are doing. And of course, we've already quoted Bark and Bolton, uh, what Michael and James say about dissociation. So all of these things together, we need to consider what happens when we think about the effect of automation on people. And finally around that, of course, we know that automation projects and tooling projects go wrong. And what happens then to people's motivation is that they have the stress of committing to an automation project that they can't always deliver because it's a magical solution. With the stress of being stuck in limbo in that situation and the stress of actually having to do the whole role they were doing before and the automation project that's overloading them. In summary, I asked the question, what are the experiences of testers with their automation and tooling? My finding, first of all, is that we still have the management and technical challenges. And what I would say to you for what we need to do, what you need to do is those challenges have been around for decades. We know about them. If you are a manager, Go look at what uh, Dot Graham has been doing over the years in her books with Mark Fuster and Soretta Gamba and on the test patterns, test automation patterns website and think about what's needed in the way of support from yourself, from management. If you're a tester, again, go to that patterns website. Think about what the messages are you need to take back to your managers to get their support. I found that testers feel stuck in limbo with magical solutions. Think about when you're being offered magic and when you're stuck in limbo. If you're a manager, think about what you're doing to other people that's causing that to happen. If you're a tester, 
Remember, you are allowed to express yourself. You are allowed to go to your managers and say, this is not working because, and here is a different solution. And whether you're a manager or a tester, whether you hold the purse strings or you're in receipt, remember illusions of usability. Look for real usability along with appropriate security, good maintainability, excellent technical features and everything you need. Remember, this is your work that's being automated, your tool for you to use. You should not be being driven by the tool. The tool should be something that you are driving, that is aiding you. So you need to go back to your jobs and think about this and think about some of the things that you can do to help. I would recommend as a simple start, you look at Jacob Nielsen's 10 heuristics for usability. That's been around for decades. There's loads about it on the internet, so I don't need to describe it now. It's very simple to use. You can apply it to any software interface. So apply it to your test tools and automation. Okay, that's a simple thing that you can do. It costs nothing. It doesn't take long. It's easy to do. What am I going to do? Well, I have possibly another three years of research to do. I'm halfway through. At the moment, I'm designing my next set of research. And one of the things I want to do is go back to those findings on the wide range of people involved in software testing. Because I think if we can find out who is doing testing and what those personas are, what the range of personas is, and if we can find out how they're doing testing, what approaches they're taking, then there's possibly a chance we might be able to understand what is the tool set the testers really need. And if we can understand those three things, who is it for, what are they doing, what tools do they need, then perhaps there's a chance that in future we may be able to design a tool set and automation that supports testers in their roles and supports the delivery of really good software that's of benefit to our organisations and our customers. My name is Isabel Evans. It's been a pleasure to take part in this conference and I hope you enjoy the rest of it. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.